Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I'm really a person that, uh, not really a quantum person these days, but I have been involved on some stages of my life, interest on electron tunneling in biology, so I'll give a little bit of a version of that. Also, in the last 25 years, have been more on, on my life on the H bar equals zero part of life. But I'm going to tell a little bit about the H bar different than zero part of life. Uh, I want to say about quantum mechanics, Linus Pauling, on his book on the chemical bond, he says that uh, quantum mechanics is necessary to have a chemical bond, but after that, biology is classical. So the question is, is that true or is that wrong? So here is a little bit of a uh, discussion, maybe is, is a long, long release uh, of things that uh, we try to present. The two ones in red are basically electron and proton transfer in biological process in enzyme are actually quantum process. We have observed that. I'll tell a little bit about that. Uh, the single fault reading on your eyes, if you have a single photo resolution, is a quantum process. The other process are very speculative. And you're going to have two great people to tell us about this other process. I'm going to just cite them. One is Professor Yarkov Lev is going to tell a little bit on this area. And we hope that Professor Singer in the end is going to tell a little bit about neurobiology, how much quantum mechanics goes in there. But I want to say that basically areas like, for example, tunneling, tunneling during smell has been a big question if there is quantum effects that. Uh, there is one area that looks very interesting. There are these birds that have these magnetic sensors. They're able to fly all over the world with this magnetic sensor. The question is, is this really a quantum process? Some people really defend that very, very uh, strongly. There is the idea about having coherence in bacteria. I'm not going to go over the entire list. You can, you can really put in some experiment, you can resonate states inside the bacteria with entangled states outside. So that's a very interesting story. And uh, I could go over everything, but I want to say that in the end, there is the question that a lot of stuff I'm going to tell in biology is what we call quantum one. What I call basically, you can explain semi-classically, but the idea if you have coherence in entangled states, the big question, and there are some people who speculate even about uh, the idea in neurobiology of having entangled states, but there's very little known about that. So I'll try to focus about the first two. Here's just a laundry list for you to, get to enjoy and think about what people have been thinking about it. Some of it you can call crazy, some of it is interesting, but these are the topics that if you do a conference on quantum biology, you're going to hear people tell you as much as they can on, on, on this subject. So let me switch the, to the topics that I said that these are well-established fields. And actually, these things was a very hot area on the late 70s and late 80s and continue after that, but people were really trying to figure out if this was possible. So that time, we started to work with several experimentalists. And they had this, uh, this is an example of several proteins that had some metal groups in the end. And they were able to bind some groups outside the protein. They were able to look at tunneling of electrons from inside the protein to the surface of the protein. They bound these ruthenium sites, and you could experiment to see if tunneling was happening, electron tunneling was happening there. The theory of electron tunneling actually is started by many people. Ruth Marcus got the Nobel Prize for it, just to have an idea. Uh, the expression there is a firm golden rule expression, just to have an idea. You think about two states, that they are in the middle of a very polarizable middle. You have a donor and acceptor separated in space. You have, like, you have to have thermal excitations in order to bring the system to resonance. And that's what gives what they call the front condom factor. That's the exponential part. That's the nuclear part. That's a KT kind of excitation on the order of fractions of electron volt. And then you have a tunneling matrix element. We call HTA square there. That tells you how the electrons actually tunnel through this through the system. So people start to work on that and really understand we know there is this quantum, there is this nuclear part that's just polarization or this sort of global coordinate of the environment. As these electrons are jumping around, you have to move all the polarization of the environment with you as, as you're moving electron in proteins sometimes like 10, 20, 30 angstrom apart. Becomes a very interesting story. So just to tell you, basically, here, I don't want you to read this slide to tell, I just show you a Fermi Golden Rule result, but there are many, many papers that were there on the 80s and 90s you are working on that. You could find the limit where the coupling of the Fermi Golden Rule was fully adiabatic. You could actually, in the case of the overdump limit, we could do that exactly using past intervals, spin balls of Hamiltonian. So there's a strong theory of that. This is just a, to, to put a little bit of a highlight of that. 
John Hopfield, who mid-70s, actually the first one to look at the nuclear part of it. And what's interesting, this is one part of electron transfer between the cytochrome that, that feeds the electron in the photosynthetic reaction center. And people could study that reaction as a function of temperature, and we start to see that you go to low temperature, it starts to flatten out, right? So when you're below, uh, below about 200 kelvins, you start to see that actually the system starts to observe some nuclear tunneling. At room temperature, actually, appears to be just a normal Arrhenius <coughs> activation, KT, but that's the first evidence for quantum tunneling on those experiments that really opens the entire field. You have nuclear tunneling here from the environment. How about electron transfer? So the question is how these donor and acceptor sites separate apart in space, these metal groups, they actually interact with the protein. That's an area we got very, very interested and got into the game. And I show you several proteins when you're actually doing this experiment in there. What we learn about this protein is that the protein break backbone actually creates a nice near periodic potential for the electron to move around. And actually, tunneling through the backbone is much easier than tunneling through space. I'm going to skip this slide and tell you that therefore we say that going through the backbone, going through bone, is a much more effective tunneling than everything else. Just to have a little bit of energies here, we start to observe <coughs> that in biology, these typical metal groups or aromatic groups that are getting electrons or transferring electrons, they are about a five electron volt. That means if you're going to tunnel through space, you, you, you have about a five electron volt barrier that's pretty large. But if actually, if you, use, if you use the bonding orbitals, right, based the valence bond of it, you actually have a barrier of about two electron volts, and it's much more efficient. So that means that if you have a big protein, the electron is going to try to tunnel through the backbone of the protein as much as it can, and it's only going to do jumps through space they have no other chance. That became a big game, is that true? Can we prove that? So we wrote a very simple theory. Because these things are exponential, and you're trying to go through bond as much as you can, there are actually a few dominant pathways. Even so, you can draw many pathways through the proteins, through all these orbitals. There are a few dominant ones. And here are some numbers. Just look at the top, tells you that you have a decay of the wave function about 0.6 per bond, when you put the numbers. You have a decay through space that falls with a 1.7, over the distance. And then the middle one is just hydrogen bonds, because you can tunnel through the lone pairs of hydrogen bonds. But you could do a model, very simple model, because there's this big difference between the through bond and the through space transfer. And then you can just do a, something where you look for the most efficient pathway with all these orbitals on the protein. And this creates a very nice piece of software. That every experimental group that works on these fields now actually starts to use it to compute if these electrons can tunnel through this protein. And the nice thing here is, like I said, there are experiments like that. And you're seeing there's a copper, copper atom on the green part there in the middle. And they create probes all over this protein. This is, this is a case of a, a cytochrome C42. And you see that how do you decide to go through one helix, or you jump between helix, how you do that, and they can actually test the theory. So it became a big game to try to understand the electron processing proteins and actually say the electrons actually tunnel. Many people believe that what well, they're conductive in things, proteins are not aerosol insulators, they actually have to tunnel through it. And like I said, it's a repeat of the first slides that to show these experiments were done in many, many, many different proteins. There are many, many different experiments. I want to show you what a couple of the results we did. The first thing is something people know that. If you have a beta sheet that's based this extended series of proteins, or if you have an alpha helix, you tunnel much better to a beta sheet. And the reason for that is because to cover the same amount of distance, you need the least number of bones, because this is straight. Why, if you go on an alpha helix, you have to go around the helix to have more bones to cover the same distance. And actually, this has been proved experimentally. That was a big thing, those first two numbers. We proposed them in a science paper in 1992. And then many experiments came afterwards and became a sort of one of the big things that based was a theoretical prediction that had been proved experimentally. Here are some other numbers to tell you what to be, how slower it will be this decay if it's not through the backbone of the protein. It seems much, much slower. So you're really dominated by this protein environment when you look into this biological system. This is sort of a great tool, a great story and tells you at that time we proved the electrons actually tunnel through protein. There's actually great experiments based on theoretical predictions. 
that's shown here. Here's a case about uh, electron tunneling in cyclotron C. And you see that basically you are looking at tunneling between many different sites. And here I just show you for you what they call his 72 and his 33. His 33 is actually longer in distance, and his 72 is actually short in distance, but it has a big three space jump. There's no chain between. You have to jump through vacuum. The proteins have actually a big void on that region. And the bottom line is that that rate was much, much slower. Like basically, you see his 72 has a rate that's one third the, the rate of his 39. I'm sorry, I said 33, his 39, but it's actually four angstrom shorter. And these numbers were predicted theoretically before the experiments were done. These are designed experiments to, to test the theory and actually tell you the story that basically biology goes through these ways. Electrons are actually tunneling through it. And the typical decays that we have was actually a major change. You don't understand that based when you're dealing with chemists doing these experiments to explain that actually tunneling is not going through the higher orbitals. They're actually going through the valence orbital. That's actually hole transfer, not really electron transfer. That creates a difference in culture that people really got very happy about to understanding about this process. So this is a change that tells in cases in biology that we know that basically takes place. And why electron transfer is quantum mechanical? Electron transfer is quantum mechanical because if you think about it, if you have a photosynthetic agent or any light harvesting system, when you throw light into the system and you absorb that light, is going to fluoresce in picosecond. So you have to create a charge separate state that's long lived, much faster than that, otherwise you waste that energy. And that's what photosynthesis does for you, okay? Creates the electron flux between this state and the state is very far enough and the back rate is much slower because we're playing with these two terms, the nuclear part and the electronic part in order to make the back rate much slower. So that's, a, that's why it has to be a real quantum process. And uh, we got very interested on that and say, is that actually true? If we go to really uh, quantum mechanical process. So we got this idea that we have been studying and we went to real quantum mechanical systems in uh, to photosynthetic system, applying this theory to the system. And we say, you actually have a dominant pathway in this case. So photosynthesis, you look at the photosynthetic crash center, you look, they have two chains. Uh, <coughs> the big green in the middle is the same thing. The first one on the right is just the chromophores. The other one is the chromophores inside of the entire protein. The right is just so you can actually see the chromophores. Uh, if you look around, there is the second chromophore, what they call the, the pheophyton, has to jump an electron to, to the quinone. That has to create a long, very long lived charge separate state. So that has to be a very efficient electron transfer. And when we do quantum mechanically, we can actually do the full green function, get the effect of all the pathways, and figure out we are done. On that paper, we, we study the effect of all these pathways with a much better calculation. And what I want to show here, forget about these lines, just look at the one at the top, is this, this electron transfer is very coherent. It means there are two possible pathways you are seeing on the top with the dashed lines, but the actually coherent, the total coherence of the system, they are adding a, they are adding a constructive interference case. And that makes the, the rate very electron transfer. Now, if you get the quinones afterwards, after you create this, they don't have to be effective. And what we show, that's the case. The system there is not a coherent electron jump back and forth. So it's very interesting that we could show that these pathways actually exist. And when there are a couple of them, they're equally effective on the systems where you have to have fast electron transfer, the system to be functional, to create this charge separate state that's requiring biology. And that's what you think about is after this charge separate state is created, then biology just do some of these electrons are transferred to protons, and then you have conventional proton pump, then you go to conventional biology. But the initial absorption of energies, both on photosynthesis and respiration, they require this, uh, this tunneling of electrons. So I want to finish to say that one of the things we did on the late 80s, even before we did this work, is actually, can we apply that? We had many, many with John Hopfield to say, can we actually build a device on doing on that? Can we actually go to quantum electronics? People are talking a lot about quantum computers. The question, can you build molecular devices that uh, believe on that? We actually have a patent on that. There are several things done on that. One beyond that was just a proof of concept. We were building these shift register cases here. 
And actually, if you look at the system here, just look at the one at the top. You see, you, you excite the electron, if you look on the right, you go to the excite state. Then you have a very fast transfer to intermediate state at that quinone, that's this ring with the oxygen, coupled to it. Okay? And then from the quinone, you do a second rate that jumps to the other end. At that moment, you see that the, inter the quinone in the middle cannot get the electron back. There's no state available there. You only can go back to the original one. So now, you tunnel two distance of about 10 angstrom, the recombination takes 25 angstrom. So it's very, very slow. So this device, you can see, it creates a long charge separate state. And if you create a polymer of these molecules, then the electron, after it gets transferred, it goes to the other side instead of coming back. And now you can actually move the charge around. So you throw one light, and the electron jump from one point on the chain of the polymer to the next one. So imagine that molecule being repeat many, many times. People build experimentally up with five of them. And you can actually do this five transfer going back and forth between these molecules and become sort of a great system to, to do this thing. So with that, I think I'm running out of time and I'm, sorry, I'm running off slides. And I think it's a good place to stop is to show that basically, on these cases, vision, electron transfer, tunneling, photosynthesis, respiration, quantum mechanics is very important. We have a very nice theory. We can quantitatively understand these things. We have been able to modify proteins, and people are even trying to build these devices. Becomes a very interesting story how to read this device, but that will be an entire talk on itself. But the idea is always basically, can we do the computing at a molecular level and just doing the, the sort of the, macros the mesoscopic part, just the beginning and the end of the process, right? So that's a very interesting question. So this is the first attempt. We have been doing a few other devices afterwards, but uh, as my chair has said, I'm out of time. So I want to stop here and thank you for your attention.